Okay, uh, maybe let's uh, start. Uh, so let me try to emphasize, re try to review a little bit what we did uh, in last class. So this is uh, maybe it's the most convenient, uh, maybe the key point in the last class uh, can be explained in a, in a simpler uh, situation, which is a situation described by this uh, homework problem. So we have a, so let's describe this homework problem a little bit. Usually, when we discuss a particle with a momentum, we just say, okay, the particle has momentum, is move around, that's it. And if your particle has a spin, then that's fine, the particle move around, and then spin just keep, keep pointing in the same direction all the time. But however, when you have so-called spin orbital coupling, then there are situations where, uh, because energy, the spin and the momentum are locked. So, so you could have a situation that uh, if a spin is parallel to the momentum, the energy is lower. That describes a lower band. If a spin is the opposite to momentum, you get another energy that's higher band. If you stay within the lower band, then the spin and the momentum are locked, always pointing the same direction. You say, so what? It's just a spin pointing uh, with a momentum. It's a slave of momentum. It's just uh, using momentum to describe it. But I mentioned the last time, as the momentum move around, you can see the px, py. If momentum can make a turn, the spin has to make a turn. When the spin making turns, you're involving overlap, because when you're calculating this phase space like running, you want to calculate overlap of wave function at the time t and at time t plus delta t. And, uh, but when the spin make a turn, you, you encounter this overlap of a spin wave function. Mm, so let's call it a spin. In one direction, with a spin in another direction. Sorry. It's a spin, direction of spin, it's a vector depend on time. And this one, in general, is not equal to one. This one is non-trivial. <coughs> Give you some kind of phase. Maybe delta, fine. This phase we call the Barry's phase. And this Barry's phase will enter into the phase space like Lagrangian in a non-trivial way. And that will affect dynamics. So actually, the dynamics of this kind of a particle do not obey Newton's law. They obey a modified Newton's law. So that is a, a, that is a, a question. So, so in this homework problem, you can see this phenomena in a much simpler situation. Uh, in the last class, we discussed a more complicated uh, situation, which is a particle moving in a crystal. And we have a, we have a situation that each unit cell has many sides. So as a result, uh, there's a man, many band. Then we don't have a many band, we have a similar situation that's, uh, you know, if, you, if a particle moving inside a particular band, you know, at this place, then this particle have a, basically this plane wave. But however, its probability weights on different sites in the same unit cell, because each unit cell have some different sites. You know, but the weight of particle on these different sites in the unit cell can be different. And they, this, this, they, they may depend on the momentum. You know, at the k and the k prime, the amplitude on these three sites may be different, may, ch may, may change around. And this is very much like a spin, <laughs> you know. It's a, so, so, so we have this uh, uh, internal wave function, this Poisson alpha we introduced the last time. And its component describes what is the amplitude on different uh, sub lattice. And uh, then as, you, as k move around, this wave change around, almost just like a spin rotate around. And uh, so we have same phenomena that uh, uh, this uh, uh, so, so therefore, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, wave, internal wave function depends on the momentum. And that's just like speed will affect the dynamics. So the, the, the new dynamics is, uh, is, uh, is written uh, in this, uh, in this Lagrangian equation.
where this uh, D D I J is uh, basically is uh, the crystal momentum and where the C I is equal to I think it's I. So basically, this is a this is results. Okay. So let's come to C. So C is actually a vector, but it's leaving the k space. You know, it's a function of k. It's a vector, but a function of k. It's uh, obtained by from this uh, wave function for each band. You know, each band we have this eigenvector which depend on k. So this is an n-component column vector. So we make a derivative of this n-component column vector, you get another column vector. It's overlap with this uh, dagger of the, of the original vector, give, a, give you something. And this something certainly depends on whether you, you make derivative with respect to kx, ky, so you get a vector. So we call c. The reason we call c is that you know, vector potential is a. It's a field strength is b. So follow that, this vector potential in k space is c, is a field strength is a d, you know, it's a, b, c, d. And so, so this is, a, so since we have a, some vector potential in k space, we just follow the tradition, we can define the field strength in k space. It's really the, it's a, it's a derivative vector potential respect to k now, because in k space, and we anti-symmetrize it. Basically, it's just a partial C i c k, then a partial k, we just anti-symmetrize and i k, just is anti-symmetrize. Then we get anti-symmetric tensor, which is a, we call the D. And usually, you know, usually we convert this anti-symmetric tensor into the vector using the epsilon symbol. So we can define the D k using epsilon k i j and the D i j. So we can, in three dimension, we can convert anti-symmetric tensor to, to vector. And this is the euro, this, this kind of vector is what we usually call magnetic field. So this is a kind of magnetic field, but in the K space. Okay. And uh, so, so, so actually this C will enter into the phase space uh, Lagrangian. And using this phase space Lagrangian, which is a fact by C, we can re-derive the equation motion. We find equation motion indeed have a correction due to this uh, a phase space vector potential, or phase space magnetic field. And so the k-space magnetic field would enter the equation motion in this strange way to modify the definition of velocity. Usually velocity is a gradient partial epsilon partial k. So now the velocity have this actual correction. And when we have this actual correction, uh, this whole equation motion is no longer in a Newton's form. It's just some, some, some other form. So it is uh, something, something can happen, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, 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 so today we will try to discuss what is, a, what is a consequence, what is an experimental consequence of this uh, actual term. Because we claim that in a semiconductor, in a semi, what is semiconductor? Semiconductor basically, you have some energy band. Then you have a few electrons in the band moving around. That may give you conductivity or some phenomena. So, so therefore, whether something measurable in a semiconductor would allow us to see whether this particular semiconductor contains this correction or not. You know, and maybe some phenomena need to be explained using this kind of correction. Yeah, so that, that's the thing. And uh, so, uh, so one thing we can do is the following. Uh, so let's consider the conductance. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned that, uh, uh, to understand the conductance in a semiconductor, we simply need to understand uh, how electron moves and the influence of electric field. And we already mentioned that, well, when you have a band, you push electron, then this uh, electron just uh, keep moving. You get oscillating currents. 
But then I also mentioned that this is something never happens. We wish we observe that, but we won't, we won't see that. Because we always have the frictions in semiconductors. And because of frictions, when electron get high energy, the friction try to bring electron back to low energy. The friction is the form of dissipation. It's trying to scatter the energy away and make something have a lower energy, like a rolling downhill, a tendency to rolling downhill. OK, so this is a friction. And because in the, in the material, the friction is, is uh, pretty strong. So therefore, uh, in the, for using ordinary electric field, we can never push this electron all the way across the banner top and to see the oscillatory behavior. And before, before electron reach the band top, the friction already bring them back to the bottom. And so, so therefore, the, the transport of conductivity we see in the auditory material, like metal, is a competition between this uh, electric force trying to drive electron, move, move, move electron in some one direction, and the dissipation, which is trying to stop electron from moving. Yeah, that's a, so this is a, this competition of two effects. So therefore, we have to introduce the friction. And it's pretty easy for us to introduce the friction because of the, um, because of this, uh, uh, because this is a, this equation motion, this is a force. So therefore, it's very natural for us to, to, to modify our equation motion. So now I'm using the electric field. So this is the first time electric field. Then we can add a friction term. We call this a gamma inverse and the velocity. So this is a friction force. And uh, then, we, then we do this. Let me. Uh, let me explain this first, then I said explain this. This term is pretty simple. You know, this is a force. And this is a, a negative force, but in the direction, in, so this force, this addition is a friction force. It's a point in the direction opposite to the velocity. You try to stop the electron from moving. So this is a, and uh, what is this term? This term used to be partial epsilon partial k. And uh, here I assume that uh, uh, the particle mostly near the bottom of band. So it's kind of quadratic. OK. So therefore, near the quadratic, in the bottom band, this epsilon can be expand as, a, as, a, as some matrix we call M inverse matrix, i, j with 1 half, k, i, k, j. So we just do the quadratic expansion. And this m inverse is just a coefficient in this quadratic expansion near the bottom band. And certainly plus a constant term. But constant term, we don't care. Yeah. And so if you we, if we, if we approximate a uh, uh, dispersion relation as some kind of quadratic form, then, the, uh, then this uh, partial action, partial k became this. We assume k is small. OK. So, so then that's it. So, so, so this is will be situation, including the friction. We want to understand how electron moves, and but, um, but under, um, after we understand how electron move around, we can understand how this uh, d appear in the equation motion and how d affect the conductance. So that is the idea. But actually, there's a, a very interesting point here. Uh, somehow, I don't like this. I don't like this. So this is a model. You know, the friction is a very complicated process. We don't understand it. Basically, when electron move around, it's, it's a hit. The, 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 the atoms may excite some phonons, and the electron may, may slow down a little bit. So extremely complicated process. And uh, when something is very, very complicated, we sometimes kind of say, oh, maybe it's simple. We're just assuming something very simple. Maybe something very complex, after averaging all those compli complicated phenomena, you get something very simple. So this is a kind of wishful thinking. You know, at the end, you get something very simple. Uh, but, but this is a model. So we tried using this something which is opposite to the velocity to model the effect of this complicated process. So very natural, it's slowed down. 
But however, uh, in this case, it may not be as natural as euro because of this term, because of this correction. You can see before, in the euro case, if you don't have a D term, something opposite to the velocity is something you go downhill. Look at this. The velocity is a gradient of energy respect to k. So you ask, in which direction I will go downhill fastest? Well, that's given by partial e partial k. That happens to be the direction of a velocity, or opposite velocity. So therefore, in that case, we can understand why friction has to be opposite to the velocity. Because that's the way you go downhill straightforwardly. You, you, you just along the fastest slope, you try to go downhill. So, so if you're using that kind of a, a picture, I should say the friction should, should be minus gamma inverse something go downhill would be this. Whatever, R will be over. And usually these two are the same, so it doesn't matter. But now these two are different. OK. So this is almost like a research problem now. I don't know how to model it. Uh, this is like a cultural, because uh, you know, why you say friction is the uh, opposite to velocity? Because my high school teacher told me so. And uh, but when you're thinking more, you say maybe it's more reasonable to, to say the friction say the friction say, the friction is the opposite to the gradient of the energy respect to k. Maybe this is a more reasonable modeling. That's the thing. That, that, that's the point. So this is really uh, again, you know, that this kind of thing all over in physics. You know, since many phenomena are too complicated to, to describe exactly. We just don't know how to. So first, we just make a guess, OK? And, uh, uh, but I hope you make some reasonable guess. And I don't know, actually, maybe this one is reasonable, or this one is not reasonable. But at the moment, I feel this one may be more, more, more reasonable. I really don't know, actually. So, so you, this, but on one hand, it's very interesting, because this became an issue. And maybe you can develop theory based on these two assumptions. And I try to compare to experiments and to see which uh, which assumption would fit experiments better? Then you, you, then you will see, yeah, maybe experiments tell us really this one or, or really this one. So actually, in the lecture notes, I present the calculation for, for both cases. And they, indeed, they, the, the consequences are different. And, but here, I only present the calculation for the second case, which the consequence, I feel, is more reasonable. <laughs> yeah. So that is a, but this kind of thing is a very, happen a lot in, in physics. Uh, you need to make a guess. And uh, then you try to think about physics about your guess. Hopefully, your guess is uh, kind of reasonable. And then you compare to experiment to see whether your guess is uh, correct or not correct. So that is the thing. So, let's, uh, so, so now let's using the second way to do uh, friction. And, uh, but once you make a guess, the rest is uh, mathematics. It's, uh, it's no longer fun, actually. Just do the calculation. You know, once you make a right assumption, then you just plug in and do the calculation. So let, let's just uh, plug in and do the calculation. And uh, so, so here, I will try to write down the matrix form. So we'll have a k dot equal to e minus gamma. So this M inverse is regarded as a matrix, and this uh, K is like a vector. So this matrix act on the vector. So using this uh, matrix form. And uh, so here I already, so this, this one actually is uh, this uh, partial epsilon, partial K. OK. Then we have this, uh, again, this, uh, again in, the, in the matrix form, we have this. Have this form. But the k dot is this. So we just plug in. That should be OK. 
So, uh, okay, and then we then we assume this. Uh, then we assume this E is oscillatory. So when E is oscillatory, we can replace this K dot as a uh, as a as a you know as a minus I omega K uh, equal to E E zero and uh, gamma M inverse. So we get some kind of algebraic equation. So with a fixed frequency, we no longer have a differential equation. And, uh, and similarly, uh, this also became algebraic equation. Okay, so it's a, uh, so this one was, became a minus i omega x dot, you know, for this uh, frequency. And uh, okay, and then after collecting things together, so I will, I will not really repeat it. We just get the following thing. Uh, the x dot became e gamma 1 minus i omega d m 1 minus i gamma omega m inverse e zero. So this just uh, after a pretty lengthy calculation. You know, uh, no, no, no dot. Oh yeah, this is dot. Yeah, it, it have a, it have a dot. It's a okay. Yeah, so this is a, a after some lengthy calculation, you get this. Okay. And uh, basically, you know, what you find is actually very simple. From here, we see how the k relate to the e. Then just uh, plug in here. And you get something only depend on e because k is already depend on e, which is obtained from there. Yeah. Okay. So what? So let's let's look at the one when omega to zero. If omega to zero, this uh, x dot is equal to e gamma e. That's when omega x to zero. When omega is zero, that's the DC case. We don't have oscillatory field. We just have constant electric field, and we keep driving it. And we see that uh, because of friction, is this, so we, the, the, the particle reach some kind of final velocity. So where the friction force and the electric force kind of balance, that's usually what we say. Okay. So we, we, did, we need to get these uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, familiar results. And the interesting to see that the D drop out. This D don't enter. So, so somehow, if you do a DC measurement, we don't see the effect of this D. We don't see this effect if you do a DC measurement. I don't know whether that's true or not. This, this became a very interesting uh, issue. If you do DC measurement, we don't see the effect. However, when the frequency is very high, if frequency is very high, much higher, you know, so that this combination, this is a matrix, basically D is also a matrix, M is a matrix. And when this combination is much bigger than one, then we can drop the one. When we drop the one, something interesting happens because this M and this M inverse cancel. So the X dot at the high frequency became E. D. Yeah. Something universal do not depend on the do not depend on the uh, uh, gamma. Yes. Uh, was this observed in experiment? Huh? Was this observed in experiment? I don't know. This is a. I haven't really gone through this uh, this uh, experiments. The random experiment will be anomalous quantum anomalous Hall effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, not quantum, just anomalous Hall effect. And uh, but uh, but uh, but from this, we will see that uh, the remember this D is anti-symmetric tensor, you know, and uh, so so maybe you can write this uh, in the component form be I equal to E E I J E J. 
you know. It's under symmetric tensor, that means if E in x direction, and this D only, only x, y non-zero, x, x equals zero. So if E is x direction, uh, x, y is non-zero, so that means uh, the, the current will be in the y direction. It's a transverse. Because D is anti-symmetric, so this is like a transverse response. So if you, if you have oscillatory field in x direction, we generate oscillatory motion in the y direction. It's transverse. It's kind of like a Hall effect, actually. And, uh, but somehow at high frequency, uh, we, we see this, uh, this uh, Hall effect. And, uh, uh, but this is universal. It does not depend on the friction. It's directly depend on this, uh, this uh, barrier curvature, this uh, magnetic field in, in K-space. So using high frequency, we can directly measure the, the magnetic field in K-space. Yeah. So that is, uh, uh, that is uh, the, the phenomenon. OK, but uh, yeah, that's basically the, uh, uh, of, of, one, of one result. OK. And uh, so, but however, the, the, the real situation in experiments is uh, it's more, complicated, more complicated than this. So let me describe uh, uh, what situation we describe, what is the situation in a real experiments. The situation we describe basically is just one particle in a band. And you say, and the electric field, and the influence electric field, how this particle move around. You know, that, that, is a, that is a picture we describe. Sometimes we can push it. We say, maybe two particles is also fine. We just add the effect of two particles. OK. So, so two particles is fine. Or maybe three is fine. So as long as we have a few particles, they kind of don't interfere with each other, this picture should be OK. We just add the effect of each particle, then that's it. OK. However, when we have a, but in, in, in semiconductor, actually, this is a case. In a semiconductor, each band only have a few particles. So actually, this really works for semiconductor. And for the metal, things are very different. For the metal, actually, uh, we have a lot of uh, Electron, which really kind of fill the band halfway. You know, most metal you just fill the band halfway. The band is really half filled. And this Pauli principle would play big role here. So those uh, this single energy level is occupied by spin up and a spin down electron at the bottom band. They cannot move around. It's just a, it's squeezed by other electron, and then. Near the this, this so-called Fermi surface, then if the electron move around, so this electron can move to the empty orbital. So electron near the Fermi surface can move around, and this will be the topic for the next uh, next week actually. So here I just uh, describe a little bit the situation. So so therefore, when we consider the motion of electron or conductance of electron looks like electron deep inside uh, uh, the, the, uh, this field energy level do not contribute. Only electron near the Fermi surface contribute. And uh, so, so we should have a theory which capture this uh, picture. The electron, only electron near the Fermi surface contribute. And the conductance should only depend on the electron near the Fermi surface, do not depend on the electron deep inside. There should be something, something like that. And uh, so in the following, uh, we will try to develop uh, this uh, 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 so-called Boltzmann equation approach. It's really try to, uh, try to capture uh, this phenomenon. So we will, so we can, uh, so, so this Boltzmann equation approach can really apply to this situation. Certainly can also apply to the situation with a few electrons. But it can apply to a situation where we have a lot of electrons. And then you can, you can have a more uh, 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 accurate way, a uh, 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 more correct picture to see how conductance happen in the material. Yeah. So this is what we are, we are going to do. 
And in the Boltzmann equation approach, we have to use equation motion at certain stage. And then here, we have to use this modified equation motion. So then we get this uh, conductance of, of a material, which, which you may have this uh, uh, phase space uh, magnetic field. OK, what is the idea of, uh, of the Boltzmann equation? In the Boltzmann equation approach, the most important thing is uh, this, uh, a distribution function. What the meaning for that? The meaning for this distribution function tells us the number of a particle in some, in some space-time volume. Uh, but in the K, also in the in, in the in the space volume and in the K K space volume. So we have this two power over three normalization, and this is G. So this is a definition, it's almost definition. So if, if you know the g as a function of r and k, this tells you in this space volume of a dr cube, we have many particles. And uh, how many particles? Well, the particle will be equal to this. Let me, let me do this. That's how many particles we have in this space volume. We have to integrate over all possible momentum. Because some particles in this space volume have a large k, some have small k. Their distribution in k is described by this k dependence. Okay. If you integrate the k, then we get number of particles in the space volume regardless their k value. But so, so this GRK is a more refined distribution. It's a distribution in K space and in the real space. To tell you, uh, in, the, in the volume of a delta R in space and the volume of uh, this delta K in the K space, how many particles do you have? So this is a number. So that is the meaning, yes. Uh, right now, we ignore the spin index. So, so we. Either we assume the, there's no spin, or we just count, uh, uh, just kind of, we say the spin up, spin down have the same distribution. You mix them, we don't, we don't distinguish it. But you have very, very good point. Uh, when you consider spin one half particle, when the spin is important, <laughs> you need to add a spin index. <laughs> you know, uh, so the actual index. And right now we ignore the spin, so we don't have that to, to make life. A little bit simpler. So this is already pretty complicated. Um, but, this, but if you rely on some kind of approximation that takes into account this quantum number, you're that little box? Yeah, this is a very good point. Um, so, so basically, this concept is against of quantum mechanics. Because we assume a, there is such thing as a, some particle with a given position and a given momentum, we assume they are both are well defined. And that's, that's a lie, actually. So, so actually, this becomes very interesting. If you want to, if your space volume and the k volume are so small, then things may break down. So he, certainly in mathematically, we say dr is, means infinitesimal. We have infinitesimal space volume and infinitesimal k volume. Well, if, if, you, if you see that picture, the whole thing just falling apart. So here we also use a dr dk. We still assume that uh, dr times dk is much bigger than h bar. <laughs> so so uh, we have a rough resolution. You know, that's a physicist. You know, we we say that uh, we have small volume, but small volume. I mean, actually, 0 0.1 millimeter is a pretty small, and uh, and usually if uh, you know for that kind of spatial volume. Uh, this condition is very easy to satisfy. The h, the h bar is very, very small. OK, anyway. So, so, this is a, so this small doesn't mean infinitesimal. It does not mean infinitesimal. It uh, means uh, some small thing, <laughs> but bigger than h bar. OK, and uh, so, so once we have this distribution, again, this uh, is a naming. You know, once, we, once we introduce this concept of the distribution, 
we can start to develop our theory. You know, before you introduce this, you don't know where to start. But once you introduce this proper concept, you can develop your theory. So I, I feel this, uh, maybe this uh, joint distribution in K and R space is the most important concept in the Boltzmann equation. Once you have that, other things just basically follows. Then it becomes mass. Okay, and uh, so, so then, so then, so, so once we have this concept, the next question is that we want to see how this, uh, how distribution evolve in times. To understand how distribution evolve in time, we have this equation. This equation describes how distribution evolve in times. OK, what that means? It means the following. Suppose we have a, a, we have a dr cube. OK? And we have a, a lot of particles in this phase space. You know, R and K are really phase space. OK? And that's at time t. Then at a, another time, maybe minus the t. Then the then this particle kind of, uh, you know, coming from the other region. Maybe let me just draw this. Uh, I shouldn't draw this way. Probably let me draw let me draw the other the other direction. Okay, coming from the other region. Okay. And uh, so, because this particle don't appear, disappear, they have to evolve from one region to another region. So, so therefore, the number of particle in the two regions is the same. So that's one point. Then there's another point, actually, the volume. The volume is also the same. Yeah. So this uh, using this volume, we use this uh, Liouville theorem. Actually, the the motion, the the motion uh, in the phase space have this property. The phase space volume can change its shape, but not changing its. Uh, Volume. The phase space region can change its shape, but not its volume. Okay. And it it have a quantum origin. That is a, you know, each phase space volume representing available state in that volume. You know, and uh, so these available states can never disappear. Disappear. That's unitarity of quantum mechanics. This unitarity in quantum mechanics led to the Liouville theorem, which is the the phase space shape can change, but their volume don't change. Because uh, this n number of particle n is the same, and the volume is the same, although shape changes. So actually, that means g is the same. So this led to a very simple uh, relation. That is uh, d dt g equal to 0. Yes? Hmm? Mm? That's right. And this is a magic. Actually. If someone's smart, they well, they realize the liberal theorem, they may discover quantum mechanics through liberal theorem, but they didn't. You know, this uh, liberal theorem tells us something's conserved. You know, somehow phase space can deform whatever, but its volume cannot change. It's it seems that there's something can each volume contains something in it which cannot increase or decrease. And only after quantum mechanics we know the thing which cannot decrease or increase is the number of states. It's, a, it's a, basically the Hilbert space dimension is constant of motion. And uh, so, I don't know, yeah, this is a, to me, I, I say, so basically this is very important because uh, in right now we derive the phase space Lagrangian via quantum mechanics. So we start with quantum theory, we have to describe the phase space Lagrangian and the classical motion from quantum mechanics. 
So therefore, the resulting phase space Lagrangian naturally have this kind of real world theorem because they all come from quantum mechanics. So basically, real world theorem became a law within the class of physics, but they're coming from the quantum physics. This origin is in quantum physics. Yeah. So this is a, but what this really means, this really means falling. You know, this G is a function of R, K, and a T. But the R and the K is a function of a T because of uh, equation motion. So the D really means I time due respect to this T, this T, and this T, then whole thing became zero. And that's all. So this is, uh, so this is uh, how the distribution function evolves. So this, is, uh, so this became very nice because uh, you have distribution function, you know how each particle evolves in time. That's this RT, KT determined by the equation motion, exactly from that equation motion. Once you know how RT, TK, KT depend on time, you can plug in this equation, and this differential equation will tell you how G evolve in time. Yeah. OK. So, so, so the equation motion, I can rewrite this equation motion. It's equation between partial G, partial T. So this is really the D, D, T, G. So this is a, a one of the most important equation. And uh, um, okay, we lost it. <clears throat> okay, let me, let me do this way. K dot. So this is a this is this describes how distribution evolve. Okay. And uh, but there is a a problem. Where is the friction? We don't have friction. I say okay, we have friction. We can describe friction by adding the friction force in the equation motion. But actually, this is not what we want to do. We do not want to do that. Because in this picture, we have a better way to model friction. So we have a different model of friction now. You can see over there, we're using something against of a gradient of a epsilon to model friction. And here, we can model friction in a more, I, I hope, in a more realistic way. So it's here how to model. Because, uh, Suppose we have a, a particle. We have some kind of distribution. And this distribution we call the G0. G0 actually is a distribution, equilibrium, equilibrium distribution. That's it. And the certain temperature, things get equilibrated. So actually, the equilibrium distribution is given by uh, the Fermi distribution, which is a function of a K uh, and energy. So so let me just write it down. Uh, 1 plus e to the, uh, I think, plus um, temperature beta epsilon minus chemical potential. So, so to, for the fermion, we have this uh, Fermi distribution, Fermi Dirac distribution. Uh, I will not cover this. This is a, this is a statistical physics uh, class. So, so there's some kind of standard distribution. So, so what the equilibrium means? Equilibrium means that the particle want to have this distribution. If you have a distribution which differ from this equilibrium distribution, the particle want to go back. You want to go back to equilibrium distribution. And this is another way to model the dissipation. The dissipation try to go back to equilibrium. And uh, so. So we want the actual thing, because this is a, 
EGDT is a how distribution changes. And uh, without, uh, without this patient, we say they change just, uh, I'll cut in this, just they don't change. But however, this, uh, 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 if you have a scattering of some of these patients, we say is they want to go back to, they want to go back to equilibrium. So if you deviate from equilibrium, this is, the, this is the term which try to decay into equilibrium, you know. You know, dtdg D, D, equal to something like a g minus g zero with one over tau, you want to decay into equilibrium. And a tau is a decay time. If a tau is a big, it means it slowly became equilibrium. It's very weak, in fact. If a tau is small, it means it quickly became equilibrium. So it's very strong dissipation. So this tau is a, we call the relaxation time describe how fast we reach equilibration. Okay, so so this is a uh, so this is a uh, uh, this is the equation, and that's it. Actually, that's all. So this is the Boltzmann theory for transport, <laughs> and we we have uh, the physics. You can see we we have a, the key point is that uh, uh, we have a model. For this patient, we call the relaxation time model for this patient, and uh, we just uh, adding this term to describe this complicated uh, situation for this patient. And once we have this, we got the equation. We can solve that. We, we got everything. So rest is mass. Okay. So how? So so next, let me just uh, just carry through the mass a little bit. And we'll see what what happens. Okay, and uh, so So here we will use the, let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, so we call this uh, delta G, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so, so what we do here is actually is a pretty uh, simple. Uh, we can see that uh, this, uh, uh, from this equation, okay, from this equation, uh, we have a uh, we have this uh, delta g, so some some small deviation from equilibrium. We ask where this small deviation come from. Well, it's a, it's come from because uh, uh, we have uh, we have some velocity or we have some kind of force. Sorry, this is a dot. So this k dot is a force. We have some force, we have some velocity, and it may just change. Okay. However, we know that if we plug in the if we plug in the, the equilibrium distribution, okay, this equilibrium distribution will will satisfy this uh, equation. So so if we plug in the equilibrium distribution. Uh, uh, this equation will be satisfied. Uh, so this will be zero. So therefore, uh, so therefore, this uh, this uh, non-zero delta g really coming from this uh, um, as a first order effect. Basically, we try to say we can just put the g zero here as a first order effect. Okay, and. Uh, so, uh, let me let me show you what to say. 
because of this, uh, so maybe, maybe let, let's try, try, try again. Because this is like, like, for example, this is a force, okay. We want to see the, the linear effect of a force, okay. So suddenly we have a force, the force may change distribution, away, drive distribution away from G0. So therefore this term, if you have a G here, this term would have a, a force. But however, for the linear term, if you only think about the linear effect, we just, we just, we can, rip, we can put G0 here. And directly obtain this. So this is actually what we do. That's one thing. The second thing is that we want to study this, uh, this uh, static case, the zero frequency case. So the static case means that the, there's no, time, no, 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 no explicit time dependence. So this term is also equal to zero. But anyway, this term is equal to zero if you're using the equilibrium distribution like this. Okay, so with this, uh, with, with this we see that uh, this, uh, uh, this G minus G zero, or we call this delta G, is really equal to this uh, uh, partial G zero, partial epsilon. Let me just write down this uh, tau velocity and uh, minus the gradient of uh, time potential plus the force. Okay, so we get these results. And you may ask how you get this result. So let's let's just just, just do a few calculations. This is a partial G zero partial R is equal to this uh, uh, one over theta partial F partial epsilon and uh, partial theta Okay, we have these results. So this basic chain rules. And it really says that, not, not f, sorry for notation, g0. So basically it says that so this, uh, uh, this g0 depends on the position k only via this combination. And this epsilon actually is function of k. But the capital potential can be function of r. So this is the key assumption here. So we imagine a situation, the cam potential is not constant. It have, have, have a spatial dependence. So if time cam potential have a spatial dependence, so then that's how this uh, G0 have this uh, spatial uh, dependence. Yes? But you were considering the linear order. Uh, G0 satisfies both of the right? Yes. The thing is that what happens is that, uh, let me see. Um, okay, so what I really following is, that, for example, so we are, now we are considering this, consider this term. Usually for the real equilibrium case, the camp potential should be constant. The camp potential should be constant. That's a real equilibrium case, equilibrium case. So, so actually there's no contribution from here, but, if, uh, if camp potential is not constant, that means uh, we only have a local equilibration. Locally, I equilibrate. But here and here, they have different camp potential. And because camp potential is not really equilibrium, and, and this G0 wants to evolve into something with a constant camp potential. And, uh, and this term describes that kind of force. If camp potential not, is not constant, then the then the things would want to move around to make time potential equivalent, constant. And so that's like a driving uh, from, so the deviate from G0. That, that's like a force. So, this is, so this, is, this is a real external force, but this is a force due to non-uniform chemical potential. Yeah, very, very good question. Yeah. And so here, actually here, we are trying to describe it. <laughs> you know, 
And remember, the only this this new have R dependence. So this this derivative only just with respect to new. Okay. So I will not really uh, go too much further. And this term just became this the first term. <laughs> that, that's all. Oh, that's all I want to say. Okay. And then we have this uh, second term. This, uh, well, we have this term. See here, k dot here, k dot really is a force. So this term basically is a force. External force term. But then we need to calculate this uh, derivative. So, uh, so what is the derivative? This uh, partial g0, partial k. Again, it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really partial f, partial epsilon, partial epsilon, partial k. Again, it's, uh, you know, the, sorry, not f, g0. Again, the g0 depends on k only via this uh, epsilon. So, so we, we get something uh, like that. And uh, this term uh, became this uh, partial g0, partial epsilon, then we have this. Uh, uh, we have this, uh, uh, and this term. This term is what we know is as a, is a became a vk, became velocity uh, minus this uh, this d times k. So d is a matrix. So here I use I use a relation over there. You know. The partial epsilon partial k is a velocity minus dk. dk dot, I'm sorry, it's dk dot. There's a dot there. dk dot. Oh, I, I kind of uh, dropping that dot. There's a, there's a dot there. Okay. But dk dot is a force. Uh, dk dot is a force. Okay. And we want to drop that. <laughs> Why I want to drop this first term? Because uh, we are calculating this term. We already have a first term here. So if you have another first term inside of this, this will be force square. That will be quadratic subleading term. And here we are only in interested in the leading term. So we, we drop that force. So this is a little bit uh, strange. You say, wow, this. Uh, this D term is dropped again, it don't even appear. Okay, we'll, we'll come back. Okay, and uh, so if you do this, so this term would give us this contribution. Okay, and uh, so, uh, so I, I didn't really go through the math, I just described the steps, you know. When you carry through this math, and uh, you will see this would, would come to this, became this. Okay, so uh, I think I make some mistake here. One over a top. Okay. Okay, yeah, so that's it. So yeah, I just want to mention that uh, in the in the over there, I already moved this tau. To this side of the equation, so that's why we have a tau over there. Yes. So, so we allow for some potential to be spatially dependent. Like, yes. Can uh, potential dependent momentum? Uh, that's probably uh, by definition we don't do that. Okay. We could make them depend on momentum, but 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 actually the, this uh, but 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 by definition the can potential it's a, it's a value which, uh, which is an assumption that we say this, uh, the momentum distribution always have this, uh, have this form. It's not arbitrary, have this form. But it's controlled by a value, a single value, which is a chem potential. If you, if you allow chem potential to depend on k, that's basically say that I allow arbitrary distribution in the momentum. So this is not an assumption. We, we kind of assume that uh, the equilibration in the, in the local region 
but in, with different mountain happen very quickly. So therefore, in each local region, the particle distribution in the mountain is more or less fixed, have this uh, Fermi Dirac form. But, uh, but somehow, the kind production also want to be the same in different region. But that is a much slower process. Because in order for the kind potential to get equilibrium, we need to bring particles from this region to that region. And that is harder. When, when particles have a conservation, uh, it's harder, it's slower. So this is, again, this question revolving is uh, have very deep physics in it. That is, uh, there's a fast process and slow process. The fast process that is in the same region, but in the moment, different momentum. And this scattering is very quick, very strong. You quickly equilibrate, and the, the distribution of momentum quickly reach this uh, uh, Fermi Dirac form. But then there's a slow process where the camp potential in one region should be equal to camp potential in another region. That requires the transport of conserved particle. If a particle can disappear, reappear immediately without conservation, then that will be also be a fast process. Then the new will be immediately be a constant. But if particles have a conservation, then, then it's hard to, for new to be constant. That's a slower process. And this is a, this Boson equation is a, right is something like a, let's average out the fast process before. Then here we describe the slow process. So what I'm doing here is describing the slow process. Yeah, it's a very important point actually. So. So once we get this, this uh, this almost done, you know. This is the results. This is G G zero is something known, something known. If you know the dispersion relation, you know the camp potential. We, we we know this. Okay, then this velocity is a uh, is a uh, with what we have over that expression over there. That's from equation motion. And this is a change of camp potential. You can see there's a force here. But it's a force. There's some effective force. But effective force is not external force. It's a combination of a gradient of camp potential and the force. So this is the, the, something where they learn something quite interesting. The motion of the electron in the in a solid is not driven by external force alone. It's driven by some combined factor. This combination of uh, external force and the gradient of camp potential. This, this combined vector behave like effective force. This effective force drive, uh, drive things around, basically. OK. And so when you say Ohm's law, you say the current is proportional to, to something, voltage. The voltage really is this, this combination. Not, not external electric field. It's this combination of a chain of potential and the external electric field. And, uh, and this drives something like current. So current is proportional to this combination. So that is a, uh, that's one thing where they learn. OK, so, uh, so, so the last, we just, so once we have this, the next thing will be very simple. We just need to compute the currents because because this 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 result basically let me rewrite this result this result basically means that the distribution equal to this plus the equilibrium one <laughs> so i can i can rewrite this in folly so if you know the a force you know the gradient for time potential then you know what is a, what should be the a static distribution this is a static distribution, which is a kind of steady state. OK. And uh, so to see how much electric current induced by some kind of external electric field or gradient current potential, we just need to evaluate the currents. And the currents, so to, to evaluate the currents, let's, let's do the following thing. OK, where do they say that? So the, the number of particles, OK. We already say that the, the, the density of a particle at R is equal to this D cube. Okay. Uh, 
where they where they say that. Okay. Yes. We will, and uh, that's a very, very good question, and uh, you, need, you need to do a little bit more. It's this approximation. So, 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 so um, thank you for asking this question. So what happens, suppose if you apply electric suddenly, you know, then you, you first, so let's just draw, you have this time, this is a distribution. Okay, you already have some distribution. When you apply electric, some electric suddenly, you boom, you get, uh, no, no, no. Distribution don't change immediately, but the distribution would would change. You, you drive the distribution to another distribution, and then it's uh, it's may may wiggle a little bit. You know, they may overshoot, they may oscillate a few times, or maybe not. They will settle down to a new distribution, and this new distribution. Uh, is what we call the static, the steady state distribution. So we, are, we so in, the, in here we basically study this part only, because it's already steady state. So in this distribution, there's no time dependence. However, to study transient, we apply a sudden change. How all the distribution switch into new distribution, and this region called transient region. And in this region, you have to include this. And then it's, a, it's mathematically doable. It's a, you can just do it. It's just a more complicated. So here, we consider a simple case. So we only study these steady states. So this allows us to say there's no explicit time dependence. Then what is a steady state distribution? It's like a, you have a particle with a friction. We we'll suddenly apply a force, we will accelerate. But eventually, it will reach a steady, final steady state, final velocity. We only study the value of final velocity as a, as a, uh, as a function of a force, you know. But not study how the x rate reach final velocity, just what is final velocity. So here is that we just study the final distribution due to the due to driving, not how they change the final distribution. Yes. Yes. The question is, there, there exists this steady state or this final state at the yes. end because if I just drive it with the force, uh, there's a probability that the system will recover its uh, state. Yeah. Its initial state, right? Yes. So this steady distribution that we have here does exist? Exists. So what, what happens is not, we don't have friction force anymore. But however, we have this kind of, a, yeah, okay. we have this. Uh, this a tendency to go back to the to the G zero, but however, we also have other tendency to drive it away from G zero. So the balancing the two give you something slightly deviate from G zero. You know, this is a force try to go back to G zero, but when you drive it, you try to make distribution different from G zero, and the competition and the balance of the two give you something something different from G0, but the difference is proportional to the force. So like a response, it's a linear response. So if, if the force is time dependent, let's say. Uh, oh, if force is time dependent, you have to include this term. Right, and then that, well, I'll have the competition between the two time scales that I have. That's right. This, this, would, be a, this would be very interesting. Yeah, so, so if, if, if a force is time dependent, then, then, then you have to include this term. So that's really, that, that's the AC part. Actually, what, what you talk here, like here we have, to have time dependent. This is the AC part. To understand this uh, AC part, uh, we cannot do, do what I did. We have to really include this term and, uh, and do, do other things. But it's, it's doable. It's uh, nice to do the AC part. You get, you get AC response. But here we only consider DC response. And, uh, so certainly, one thing you want to ask is following. You know, well, remember what you try to get is that we want to see whether, whether there's some response which is C the D or not. And here we see that, in this theory we see that the AC response uh, can see D. But the DC, 
if omega equals zero, there is no d dependence over there. So we need to have a AC to see the D. And here it looks like we are getting the same result. You can see at the linear order, there's a, there's a D effect. D coming from here, they kind of drop out. There's no D here. So it looks like we don't have any D dependence in the DC response. But actually, we all see that we, we do have a D dependence in, in the DC response. Actually, it's right, coming right here. And here I just explain what the meaning of G is that if you integral over K, we get a density. So that is the meaning of a distribution. Okay. And uh, so how to get the currents? How to get the currents? Um, okay, how to get the currents? The currents actually is a, is a falling. It's the same thing as uh, this. It's almost like a density. So if you integrate everything, we get density. But current is like a weighted average. It's a weighted, it's, we have some weight. Because some particle may contribute to large current, some particle can contribute to small current, depending on their momentum. Remember, velocity depends on momentum. So some momentum have a, contribute to large current, some momentum contribute to small currents. So we have to include the current contribution from each momentum, which is really just a velocity. It's an electric field times a velocity. So that's current. If every particle have the same contribution, we just get total number. If, if every particle have this EV, then after adding them up, you get this uh, total velocity times E, uh, which is given current density. So current density just equal to that. And that's almost everything, because this, uh, this G is what we already derived here. It's just this, this term. If you plug in, you get everything. And here, the ma and here I realize the magic happens. Because this velocity is a, is a, is a, so, so okay, so let, let me just go one, one step further. So this one can become dk. Vk. Then we have a delta g plus dk. G zero, we have these two terms. We have these two terms. And this delta G term is what we don't, without the G zero, is this part. It's something due to the non-uniform chemical potential and due to the external force or due to external electric field. So that's the delta G part. Okay. But then we have this part. So usually this part equal to zero. Why this part equal to zero? Because, uh, because of V. So let's consider this part. Because of V is uh, actually, it's a partial epsilon, partial K. And the G zero is a functional epsilon. <laughs> So you have a, a, so this whole thing, this whole thing is a, is a derivative of some function of a k. It's a, some function. And uh, so, so maybe I shouldn't say this. Uh, this is not the right way to say this. Uh, So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, how do, how do, how do, how do I argue this? This, uh, yeah, the, the K, this, this one, you need, 
this integration is periodic and uh, indeed and simply this is a uh, uh, if you do the partial integral let me see if you do the partial it's not really partial integral. I think this is really a function of k you have a uh, something of function the derivative yeah yeah you, you basically you with this you can you can you know there, this whole thing indeed is just some function of uh, some function for is there's some 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 strange function for of epsilon, you, you can really written in this way. Yeah, you just, you just do the integration of epsilon, okay. And uh, so, uh, oh, another maybe, maybe, maybe better way to say. It. I'm sorry. Uh, you you can you know this is a uh, okay. This is a d. Okay, let me let me let me just let's do one dimension is more much more clear. <laughs> Just that I'm confused by the higher dimension. In one dimension, is this is like this, and then it's really this a uh, d epsilon d zero uh, epsilon, and uh, and uh, so uh, so let me see. In one dimension, Yeah, looks like I need to do this. Uh, oh yeah, actually there's a there's a two parts. Uh, I think I'm sorry. This uh, if you do this, there's a. I think there's a. I have to do this part and this part. Eventually, they cancel out. But yeah. Yeah. In that case, the epsilon decay is just uh, all power uh, by zero. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this this actually this this uh, this really says that uh, for any for any equilibrium distribution respect to energy, in the usual way, you get a zero velocity. Yeah. But however, we you can no longer use this because. Uh, Velocity is no longer equal to this. Velocity is not that. And uh, so, so actually, the velocity have another contribution. So this contribution, is contribution is uh, over there. So the first contribution includes zero, but the second contribution is uh, dijk, k dot. So because velocity is not just a partial epsilon, partial k, but have the second term. And the second term have this. But the k dot j is a force. So actually, it's an it's a, it's a electric field, j. And that's it. So. Uh, So let me just write down one more, one more, one step more. So then we can now, now we can plug this into here, and uh, uh, so this just became dk. Okay, and then we can uh, we have this uh, uh, partial g zero, partial epsilon, uh, partial g zero, partial epsilon. And the V here, okay. So then we get this uh, E V I V J and uh, with a tau. And uh, that's about it, I think. And then we have this uh, combined this uh, force. Maybe they call it E E. Okay. So that's the first term. The second term is just that. I will let me not copy it. Okay, yeah, I, I forgot there's one other thing. It's a partial G zero, partial epsilon. Okay, that, that's about the story. Okay, let me try to make sure I, I get that thing. I think there's a minor sign here. Okay. So let's 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 consider second uh, this is second the this first term, what this means. 
Uh, this is Euro term, you know, in the any textbook, you, you will get this term. And this term have this uh, factor, partial G0, partial epsilon. What that factor is. Remember, the diffusion is something like some, some states, energy level below nu is occupied, above nu is, uh, is uh, unoccupied. So, so therefore, uh, this occupation number, so that so that so G zero in this region is a one. Oh, sorry. Okay. Mm. Let me see which one. Yeah, G zero in this region is one, and the G zero in this region is zero. So their derivative are equal to zero. Only near the Fermi surface, <laughs> this derivative partial g0, partial epsilon is non-zero. It's like a delta function there. So this partial c0, partial epsilon is like a delta function, which is non-zero only near the Fermi surface. And uh, so, so therefore, this contribution only near Fermi surface. That's very expected. And then what is contribution? Then on the Fermi surface, you have this two velocity. You know, two velocity near Fermi surface, you do some kind of average of this two velocity, get a tensor, and put some E, put some epsilon there. Then that tells you how they respond to this, uh, this combined electric field and the gradient of, uh, of a vector potential, a chemical potential. Chemical potential. So, that's a, so, so, so that is a form of this. Uh, of this uh, 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 result, of Boltzmann equation, and uh, so 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 in the, in the, in the standard textbook, we, we get this term. That's that tell you how how to how to com compute the conductivity. So so if I if I if I if I just uh, write it. So let me just uh, write this expression for the conductivity tensor. The conductivity tensor actually is a G I J is equal to, for the record, you may get some correct expression, uh, tau e squared partial g0 partial epsilon, then the average of velocity. So these are both a function of k, basically. And the minimum conductivity tensor is that so this uh, j i is equal to epsilon i j plus or times this uh, minus gradient partial j potential and the plus uh, divided by e actually and put electric field here j so basically they tell you there's a uh, this effective electric field drive the current and the coefficient is this conductivity tensor But but here we have this. Uh, so now this is a new term is here. And this term is a very very interesting. This term actually is a let's call that a g zero i j. But they only depend on this uh, <laughs> external electric field. They don't depend on the change of a chemical potential. They don't have this form. So they have a different dependence. So this is a this is a combined effect. That's euro euro driving force. But however this transverse current is not that. Transverse current only depends on the pure uh, electric field inside the material. But it is a DC effect. <laughs> So this is a so this is a different from the previous calculation. So we see that there is a DC effect. If you but this becomes delicate. If your material have no electric field in it, only have a change of potential, then the change of potential would only can drive current, but only via the first term. To see the second term, you have to make sure. Your material have a 
external electrical inlet. So there's a, and uh, so this is this is non-trivial thing. Okay, so that's that's actually this is what I learned. So what is this? Uh, what is this uh, actual uh, term? The so let me just write down the actual term. What is uh, this uh, G zero? This uh, this uh, this new term. And from all this, we can see the following. So actually, this is uh, this is my main result here. And uh, uh, there's a current here. There's a e here. I think I missed. Uh, there's another e here. There should be another e. Okay. So uh, so so it's really what what happened. This is uh, this uh, this epsilon zero i j. It's really equal to the e squared over h bar e k cube over two m cube, and uh, d i j and the g zero distribution. So this this is the formula. This is string response only responding to the electric field. And you may say there's no h bar here. Yeah, I kind of sloppy because uh, the velocity is really this partial epsilon partial p. So I here I say velocity equal to partial epsilon partial k. So they differ by h bar. So I, I basically doing computation assuming h bar equal to one. So here I have to restore the h bar. So so this is a more correct expression. And this will lead to the top in next class. Because uh, this expression looks quite interesting. Because if, if we have band which are totally filled, if you have a band which is totally filled, if a band is totally filled, that means G0 is always equal to 1 in the whole band. We should get the insulator because uh, look at the first term uh, here. Uh, yeah, look at this, this term. G0 always equal to 1 in the whole band. So it's a gradient respect to uh, epsilon is 0. Because the camp potential is uh, much higher than the band top. So the, every, every part of the band is filled. So occupation is 1. So G0 equal to 1 for the whole band, certainly your derivative equal to 0. The whole thing equal to 0. So we, we often expect result. A field band is insulator, have no conductance. A field band. And the conductance appears only when you have a Fermi surface like this, where, where the filling from 1 change to 0. And this, this kind of seashore, this, this at the edge, then this is non-zero, you have something. Without this step, you don't have anything. But this is no longer true for the second term. This is a D for D term. If a G equal to 1, then we get the integration of this uh, magnetic field over the whole Brouillard zone. And this is a famous number called the churn number. And it's quantized. It's a, if you do that, this is always equal to integer. <laughs> Amazingly, this is always equal to integer times 2 pi, I think, to be more precise. And uh, yes, for the field band, yes, for the field band. Mm -hmm. So if a band is not filled, mm -hmm. then, then this G0 is equal to 1 for the field part, 0 for the unfilled part. So you have some kind of integration with D, but only for the field part. In that case, this integration is not quantized. But however, if the whole band is totally filled, then, then this integration is quantized, either equal to 0 or equal to 2 pi or something. And, and this is a phenomenon of uh, 
integer quantum Hall effect. That is, uh, if you have some special band, that this band have a have a, some kind of k space magnetic field, and its average its integration is non-zero. Then, because a, a theorem by turn, then this uh, uh, this integration has to be some integer, and uh, then this uh, then you have you have a field band with non-zero Hall conductance. Yeah, and uh, uh, certainly non-zero re really means that you know. In two dimension, dxx equal to zero. Only dxy not equal to zero. You know, in two dimension. So it really means non-zero really means uh, so dxy this integration equal to integer mass times two pi. So you have this uh, very strange quantized value of uh, sigma xy. That is a uh, your drive a current. If you, if you apply electric in one direction, the current goes to transverse direction. That's response. And so, so this became uh, maybe the main result of this uh, today's lecture is that uh, indeed uh, this uh, uh, this uh, the, the the dxy can be measured in the DC measurement, but the requirement is that uh, is uh, the the electric field inside your sample has to be non-zero. It's not just Change your time potential. The electric has to be non-zero. Usually inside the metal, because screening effect, the electric field is zero. So it's a little bit tricky uh, to to see to see this. One part has to one has to design your sample in a particular way to make sure the electric field is at inside the sample. Then you may see this effect. But on the other hand, I have to say that I'm not sure whether what I'm telling you is correct or not. They are based on a particular dissipation model, this relaxation time model. In the Boltzmann equation, we have this particular relaxation time modeling to model dissipation effect. That may not be correct, actually. And uh, so when you have a, a D over there, and the dissipation may do something else, may have some other contribution, I'm not sure. But uh, within this rela relaxation time model of a dissipation, we get these results. So it'd be kind of nice to see whether experimentally uh, how how one see that. Actually, this is a surprise for me. You know, I, I only discovered this while preparing this class, and uh, so uh, so I wonder whether this is really really true or not. Yeah. Okay. So in the next class, we'll we'll come to this uh, strange thing. We have a band who's a who's the integration for a magnetic field in the case space is non-zero. So this represents a new kind of insulator, uh, we call a chain insulator, and uh, we have a theory about that. Okay, okay, I will stop here. <laughs>